Just a few weeks ago, a headline in the Daily Mail Online read, Horror at mass sterilization camp in India as women are dumped unconscious in a field after painful operation. Just two doctors sterilized over a hundred women in a single day. Now news from Bengal. In a shocking case of medical negligence in Bengal's Malda district, two doctors sterilized 103 women in a day and left them unconscious and without medical assistance in a neighboring field as part of a mass health drive. When I started this report, I just wanted to show how a horror like this could show up in today's news like it's just no big deal. I'm Melissa Melton reporting for InfoWars Nightly News. Sadly, stories like this coming out of India are not uncommon. But how did the country get to such a barbaric place? Covering the history of the last 50 years of family planning in India would be too broad and multifaceted a topic for one simple special report. But here are a few of the highlights that brought India to where it is today. 1952. India begins the world's first government-sponsored family planning program. This is one of the few rural-based family planning programs in the state of Madras. It is directed by Joseph John's wife, Padma. Using posters and other aids, Padma describes the problem in personal terms, which the villagers can easily understand. This same year, the Rockefeller Foundation creates the Population Council, and India becomes its first focus country. Throughout the 1950s, India's family planning program expanded rapidly, with a large increase in outside funding. Fewer children mean more money, which means more food, better clothes, and education, even more love. More love. More love. Many organizations from the United Nations World Health Organization to the Population Council to the Ford Foundation carry out population control research programs throughout the country. The 1960s saw the Indian central government introduce method-specific family planning targets for each of India's states, and these targets are considered an incentive for family planning workers' job performance. Though incentives are paid to family planning personnel and family planning acceptors, the practice of using targets ultimately evolves into sterilization being the primary birth control method of India's program. Once the women are convinced of the value of family planning, a medical doctor is brought into the program. And sterilization coercion against the populace ensues. In 1960, the first mobile vasectomy camp appeared in the Indian state of Maharashtra which sterilized over 15,000 people in a five-week period that year. The idea of contraceptive social marketing propaganda is developed. In 1965, the U.S. State Department begins a new population assistance program through USAID. Again, India is a focus. The UN and World Bank also send a population mission there, and the World Bank defines its program in terms of quotas. The country's family planning budget grows by 300 percent. Family planning is as important as improved food production. More food will be canceled out by more people if the birth rate is not checked. Robert Comer of the National Security Council tells President Lyndon B. Johnson, you may want to consider ways and means of gradually using our foreign aid as more an incentive to major efforts in this field that field being birth control. In that year alone, the Population Council also sent over a million intrauterine birth control devices, or IUDs, to India. In 1967, the United Nations founded UNFPA, a family planning trust that would later be called the Population Fund. President Johnson has begun using food as foreign policy leverage. In his speech to Congress on the Food Aid for India Act, Johnson praises India on stepping up family planning. This leverage led to a campaign to get 29 million women to accept IUDs between 1965 and 1967. Johnson also declares, quote, nations with food deficits must put more of their resources into voluntary family planning programs. In 1970, the World Bank begins a family planning loan program under President Robert McNamara, a man who focused on kill ratios when he was Secretary of Defense during the Vietnam War. At this point, India is already on its way to becoming the World Bank's biggest debtor. In an interview with Baltimore Magazine, Alan Guttmacher, who served as president of Planned Parenthood and vice president of the American Eugenics Society, says, if you're going to curb population, it's extremely important not to have it done by the damned Yankees, but by the UN. Because the thing is, then it's not considered genocide. Guttmacher previously endorsed coercive population control in India 
if voluntary means did not work. In 1973, UNESCO's Mass Media Family Planning and Development Study is released. India is one of its target countries. Through the use of school textbooks and mobile publicity vans, the program's stated objective is to reduce the Indian birth rate from 41.7 per 1,000 to 30 per 1,000 by 1977. Dr. John Rock says, A society which practices death control must at the same time practice birth control. The main slogan used in the campaign is, two or three children now, more never. India has already committed itself to the goal of reducing its population growth by 40%. In 1974, then National Security Advisor Henry Kissinger directs National Security Study Memorandum 200, and Kissinger advises that because population growth determines increases in food aid demand, allocation of such resources should consider what steps a country is taking to control their population. Would food be considered an instrument of national power, the document asks? Between 1975 and 1977, India Prime Minister Indira Gandhi declares a state of emergency in India. Population control becomes an urgent focus. People are jailed and some are even killed for resisting the family planning program. In the end, 8.3 million Indians are coercively or forcibly sterilized in camps in just one year. 1984, the World Bank releases a World Development Report advocating sterilization vans and camps in the third world, possibly because of their success in India. The U.S. openly announces the key rationale behind its population assistance is to reduce fertility, claiming slowed population growth would raise economic development. 1988, the UN World Health Organization publishes its phase one clinical trial of a birth control vaccine it created through a partnership called the Task Force on Vaccines for Fertility Regulation that also included the UNFPA and the World Bank. The trial adds the pregnancy hormone HCG to the tetanus toxoid vaccine, causing the female body to attack its own pregnancy hormones, effectively keeping women from getting pregnant and aborting those who already are. In 1995, it was found these vaccines had been given to Philippine women without their knowledge, and Aka women in Thailand were forced to take them in order to get ID cards for their children. <laughs> In 1989, part of the USAID program in India uses a benchmark on how many pregnant women receive two tetanus toxoid shots during their pregnancy. That same year, the birth control vaccine was being tested in New Delhi. In 1995, schools are considered an important vehicle for population control education, and the UN releases a newsletter noting that population-related values and beliefs are being conveyed in hundreds of lessons in Indian school textbooks in all subject areas and at all three stages of India's education system, including kindergarten. In 1997, the World Bank begins a new program in India called the Reproductive and Child Health Project at a cost of $308.8 million. The final report for this project, released in 2005, notes that it was considered largely unsuccessful due to a number of factors. One, a cause of concern over the, quote, lack of rise in permanent method contraceptive prevalence rate, permanent contraception. The report also reveals the World Bank has conducted no less than seven scientific birth control research projects in India under that program alone, including one where styrene malleic antidride, a polymer, is injected into the male's vast deferens tube to inhibit sperm. Finally, the Indian government issues its new National Population Policy 2000. Key tenets of its action plan include making safe and legal abortion services more attractive to women, eliminating the current cumbersome procedures for registration of abortion clinics. The plan also pushes eugenics on the poor segment of its population with an open call to quote, link the provision of continued facilities to urban slum dwellers with their observance of the small family norm and that couples below the poverty line will be rewarded if they follow the new rules, including the adoption of a terminal method of birth control after the birth of their second child. The policy also notes that 97% of the sterilizations carried out in India are on women. 
So after 50 years of outside influence through organizations such as the United Nation, their World Health Organization, their Population Fund, the World Bank, the U.S. government, and a multitude of NGOs, including the Ford Foundation and the Rockefeller Foundation, which in its Population Council reports on India openly says its programmatic focus is to provide evidence to shape national policies and programs on reproductive health. This, this is what India has designed for itself. One of the family planning goals in India has been met, as fertility has dropped drastically in the nation over the last half a century. Whereas it sat at 6.0 in the 1950s, it's sitting at just 2.58 today. And if reduced fertility and slowed population growth really automatically equaled economic growth, the way that the United States government, the United Nations, the World Bank, and these other NGOs claim, then why is it that India has the fourth largest economy in the whole world, and yet the per capita income or income per person is still just 1,500 US dollars a year, with a third of the country living below the poverty level? Today from India, we are seeing stories in the mainstream news of 98-year-old men coercively sterilized, presumably to reach family planning targets that never went away. Question. While in Madhya Pradesh's Reva district, even the old have not been spared. These men, aged 98, 80, are being forced into sterilization by the village officials. Other Indians have claimed they were either drugged or snatched off the street and forcibly sterilized, including one man who was denied a rabies shot for his dog-bitten son unless he got sterilized first. A 25-year-old Raju who had taken his two-year-old son for an anti-rabies vaccine to Bhopal's JP hospital. In fact, the treatment was given out to him only if Raju underwent the entire process of sterilization. Sometimes an Indian state government will run a drive offering free cars or television sets in exchange for sterilization. And India's school textbooks are filled with propaganda telling their children that the unemployed have nothing better to do than have sex and procreate. Here is a nation where over a hundred women can be sterilized and dumped in a field like it's no big deal, like they're just human pieces of garbage. Here is a nation where we can clearly see the social engineers modern eugenics movement in all of its disgusting glory. And while Infowars has reported on these kinds of stories before, we always get comments from people who say things like, well, India, China, those kinds of nations, they are overpopulated. And, and they really do need to do something about that for the good of the earth or what have you. However, if that's the case, then we need to stop calling it family planning, stop calling it maternal health, and stop calling it human rights, and start calling it what it really is, eugenics and genocide. It's not a woman's right to be sterilized and thrown into a field like a piece of trash. These aren't family planning targets or acceptors. They're human beings and their victims. As investigative eugenics writer Yurian Maison of ExplosiveReports.com notes, we have to look at who sets the standards, provides the technology, recruits the medical personnel, and on a global level enforces these sterilization policies through binding treaties and other supranational strangleholds. Part of the, uh, a great part of the people is uh, occupied with the pretext and uh, is not looking behind it. Are these women's rights being upheld? Will your daughters be? Will hers? This isn't just happening in India. This is happening all over the world. The United Nations can and should play an essential role in helping the world find a satisfactory way of stabilizing world population. That growth is most efficiently managed by the private sector. But regulation of the process by national governments and international bodies is also needed, and once again, the United Nations should certainly be among the catalysts and coordinators of this process. In the draft copy of the United Nations Global Biodiversity Assessment, it states very clearly that we must reduce the human population down to about one billion people. When I started this report, I just wanted to find out how a horror story like this could show up in today's news like it's no big deal. What I found instead was a piece of a much darker global eugenics plan for mass population control. For InfoWars Nightly News, I'm Melissa Melton.